position in Well, uh, my name is Charles Dwight Childs. I go by my, my middle name, Dwight. My position on the aircraft is co-pilot. Mr. Charles, you were a co-pilot on a B-17. Right. Describe that, that position and what it was like. Well, my duty, as I saw it, was to assist the pilot in takeoff, landing, uh, in-flight duties, uh, but also to uh, assist the pilot in the uh, uh, performance of some of the uh, activities behind the cockpit, uh, through the bomb bay, into the uh, waste gunner's uh, radio operator or tail gunner. If, if there was any trouble back there, I would be the one to go back and uh, take care of it. Without getting into the uh, September 11th trouble, what were some of the routine things that you as a co-pilot would need to share? Well, routine things would be uh, before the takeoff, uh, we'd go through the checklist and I'd check off as a, ca as a captain would check off uh, various things, that, you know, flaps and, and all all the routine things, but uh, I would also be there before the takeoff to assist the uh, pilot in uh, being sure that uh, everyone had their parachute, everybody had, had the, the, uh, na the things that they had to do before the takeoff, just helping the pilot do things. Students in, in behind where you sat were where most of your duties were at base. You would help the waste gun or the radio, the tail, the bottom turret, the bed to the top turret. Yes. Okay. Um, was, it, was it boring being a co pilot? No, we had pre flight duties and we had in flight duties, uh, and we always had the uh, hopeful. Uh, situation that we might uh, be first pilot, and that happened a lot. Did you ever take over as pilot? Uh, well, I did a lot of uh, duties in that respect, but uh, I, I always had the, uh, the hope that I could become a first pilot after so many missions, yes. Uh, is it true that a lot of co some co-pilots, uh, or, or that uh, co-pilots Uh, I've heard it, but uh, I can't really believe that that uh, would be an actual situation. Uh, we had duties, and uh, we responded to those duties, and I never thought too much about that. I was always afraid before every flight that, uh, you know, we may get shot down, this might happen, or that might happen. But, you know, after you, uh, on your way back, uh, you resolve those. Well, I thought it was great uh, getting to know the guys. Uh, there was no real distinction between officers and enlisted people. You, you all felt part of this aircraft. Uh, you felt part of the ground crew. They took care of it for you. So uh, it was a dedicated uh, situation for me. And I think most of the crew felt the same way. Do you remember your first mission? Yes, indeed. Well, uh, it was to a um, um, a sub pen on the coast of I uh, can't recall what I think it was in France, but it was a short mission, and I'm I'm, I'm glad that they initiated me into a relatively. Uh, short mission. Uh, we bombed some sub pens over there and uh, it was about a three hour mission. Um, throughout your first 13 missions, what do you remember as being the most uh, uh, memorable? 
Well, I would have to say the last mission, uh, it was a oil refinery south of Berlin. And at that particular time, oil was a very vital situation for the Germans because they were running out, like you said, they were running out of oil. And uh, they would do anything to protect the refinery. We had two wings. One went north, over the North Sea, across Denmark, south, south of, of, of Berlin. Our wing went over the coast of Holland, Germany, and uh, Dresden, Leipzig, and to the north to bomb this refinery. Uh, we were hit by fighters about, uh, I'd say about 15 or 20 minutes before the IP, which we call the initial point when you're directed into your target area. And uh, they said, according to 8th Air Force history, there were 500 uh, attacks that day, which means that, what I think it means that 250 fighters came up and uh, landed and refueled and came back up again. But they uh, did a lot of damage to our uh, our wing, particularly the 100th bomb group. But it was uh, my significant uh, event as far as uh, missions are concerned. That was your 14th mission? 14th. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, what happened? Well, I can't really recall anything uh, significant before we uh, left, except when they woke us up and I asked the uh, the guy who uh, awakened our crew uh, how many pounds of fuel we're putting on today, and it was max. So I knew it was going to be a long mission. And uh, in in the briefing room, uh, it appeared to me to be uh, a very, very uh, uh, significant mission for the 8th Air Force. And I was prepared prepared for that, and, uh, and that was our job. And uh, honestly, I was afraid every time I took off, but uh, I was uh, happy that we could accomplish something. Was that the mission that you uh, that your particular plane exploded? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Take us to just before the explosion of your airplane. You were you were a few minutes before minding your own business in your co-pilot seat. What? Well, uh, we were about uh, I'd say ten minutes from the IP, which is the initial point before your bomb run. And uh, we were attacked by fighters, FW-190s, ME-109s, and uh, strangely enough, they were coming in from 6 o'clock high, which from the tail, I could look over to the right, and I could see the pilot of the ME-109 or the FW-190. I see his goggles in his face, and... Uh, of course, they were firing 20 millimeter uh, explosive incendiary and uh, all kinds of 20 millimeter shells. And uh, I didn't realize it until later that uh, my right thigh and knee was sprayed with uh, incendiary uh, shells. But the next thing I, I realized that uh, the, uh, uh, light engineer in the top turret came down with his right hand shot off. And he was hit with a, uh, a 20 millimeter shell. So uh, it was my duty as co pilot to come down and, and uh, render uh, aid. I gave him uh, first aid with a tourniquet on his right arm. Uh, snapped on his chute. We had hooks and, and uh, you know, the anyway, I snapped on his chute and I put on a, uh, a uh, static card 
So if he couldn't remember to pull his rip card, it would open automatically. And just pushed him out of the airplane. And uh, he recovered. Fortunately, he was picked up and uh, the Germans gave him medical aid and he was repatriated under the uh, Geneva Convention, sent back on the Grips home, which is the international uh, Red Cross ship. And he got, he got back before we did. But where were you stayed at Where did you put him out, push him out, and what happened there? There is an escape uh, chute where where all of us in the front part of the plane pull ourselves up and come into the aircraft right below the cockpit, and uh, that's where I pushed him out. And as I turned around to return to my position as co-pilot in the cockpit plane blew up and uh, we had fuel transfer valves ablaze in the uh, uh, in the area Bombay area we had uh, a right wing on fire so when the plane blew up I was blown out I was right right there when, when the airplane disintegrated and uh, the uh, flight engineer and the navigator who's in the nose, he was blown out. And uh, we were the only survivors. Unfortunately, the, the other crew members did not, did not live. Well, when I was when I was blown out, I uh, I had my oxygen mask on, which covered most of my face. I can't recall I can't recall what I had on my head, but it was covered. So I uh, I didn't have any eyesight for a few minutes, but we were about we we, we were oh, around nineteen thousand feet. So I had time to uh, regain my eyesight. So by the time I I landed, uh, my eyesight had recovered. Where did you fly out? Well, I had broke I I had broken my leg in uh, uh, December of nineteen ninety three. Yes. Yes. Uh, Okay. Well, I hit the ground in uh, a rather mountainous area, but uh, not in trees. I, I hit in uh, level ground, but I did break my leg, and I did have my leg sprayed with flak uh, or fragments. So I was uh, in a situation where I couldn't uh, run or or. So I just wrapped myself up in my parachute and waited till somebody came and and uh, rescued me, which is very nice. And I mean, they were compassionate people. <laughs> it's not like landing in a city, you know, like Frankfurt or where people are angry. How did they treat you immediately? Well, I tell you, it's very interesting. Uh, they took me to a farmhouse. And uh, there was a lady, an elderly lady, who spoke English. And uh, she, she said, young man, you've come to a very bad place. She said, I'm a devout Catholic, and the, most of the people in this area are Catholics. And uh, we don't like Hitler. <laughs> and I was amazed at her frankness, you know. Because she was li like 80 years old, and she didn't care what happened. But... Uh, well, she did, I'm sure, but uh, she was very honest and frank with me and said, I'm sorry you're here, but I hope they treat you well. And how did they treat you? Where did you go for medical treatment? Well, we went to, like everyone, goes to the uh, interrogation center at Oberussel, right outside of Frankfurt. 
And then from there, we went to our permanent camp, which is uh, Starlog lived at one, uh, 17 miles from Poland on the Baltic Sea. And the only unfortunate thing about that camp was that uh, uh, if you wanted to escape to dig a tunnel, you dig down about three feet and you hit water. <laughs> so uh, that was not an option for us. But our duty as an American prisoner of war was to give our name, rank, and serial number and to uh, do your best to escape while you're in as a PW. And uh, I resigned myself to the fact that I would be there for pretty much for the duration. Your medical attention to Scott, where did you get it? I got my medical, uh, primary medical attention at the air base. Lufwaf Air Base, from which the aircraft came up to attack us. And uh, it was actually uh, in a place called Shemitz, which is, I think, between Leipzig and Dresden in that area. Yeah, but, but they were very attentive to me. Uh, my flight engineer, they amputated his arm right here. Uh, he was sent to uh, Sweden. Uh, he was repatriated on the uh, uh, Swedish American Line ship to Grips Home, which had been uh, commandeered for the International Red Cross. Uh, we were, I don't know of anyone who wasn't given good medical attention. I think it was mainly because uh, the Germans knew that we were capturing many, many of their pe of their people, and uh, Hitler really wasn't in charge of compassionate uh, uh, situations. He was in charge of of the aggressive stuff, you know. But I believe whoever was in charge of taking care of of the Geneva, I think the Geneva Convention. Uh, they honor that. Now, Russian soldiers and other uh, other people who were not a party to that uh, agreement were treated very badly. As a matter of fact, I've got uh, pictures that uh, I gathered after the war of some of those people who pretty badly, uh, pretty badly treated. How would, overall, uh, the, where again did you get medical attention and, and how were American flyers treated? I would say in the area where I went down, it would be equivalent of a uh, city hospital in a small town. No, uh, tell me, you got treated at a Luftwaffe hospital, right? That, I was transported there, and it was, a, I would say, at least uh, 50 miles. Mileage in that area is pretty small, really. How was the treatment, medical treatment, describe the quality of the medical treatment given to American flyers and who gave that treatment? Well, uh, <clears throat> according to uh, my flight engineer, who lost his right hand, uh, his amputation came right about above the wrist. And uh, it was a very uh, precise and a very uh, professional medical treatment. Um, as far as I was concerned, I, I had very, very good treatment on my leg. So I, I would say they uh, uh, did a good job. Did you find that to be true when you talked to other flyers at Starlog 1? Yes. Uh, when I checked into Starlog 1, uh, we had a medical, a, a, a British medical officer. And I said, how, have you, how long have you been here, sir? And he said, this next Christmas will be five years. And I said, well, you must have been captured at Dunkirk. And he said, no, sir, I was captured before Dunkirk. But he looked at he looked after us as if we were his children, and he was a very compassionate and very precise uh, physician. 
during your time uh, as a POW, how long was that time, and did you ever fear P-17, and what was that like? Well, um, I was there from September 14th, I suppose, until the end of the war when we were liberated, liberated by the Russian uh, army. But uh, I can't recall a lot of American missions in that area. There were quite a few RAF uh, bombings of the uh, Pinamundi uh, uh, V-2 uh, rocket sites, and those were at night. Uh, but we did uh, uh, have, have B-17s come over and but we were in kind of a remote area. We were in uh, on the Baltic Sea, 17 miles from Poland. So the only significant target area was uh, Pinamundi. Do you recall during the POW months ever seeing P-17 spawns? Yes, yes, we did see some. Mm -hmm. Describe that. What, what was that like? Well, I. <clears throat> I kind of thought that these may be uh, shuttle missions to Russia because there were several several of those going on and uh, so we did see some we also saw some that uh, were pulling over in our area to to go around Berlin but we weren't we weren't that far from Berlin and they and they were they were hitting targets like uh, like the one that we uh, refineries and other areas. Do you remember what no. went through your mind uh, when you saw B-17? Well, all we really saw were vapor trails. We really couldn't see the aircraft themselves, but we knew if it was daylight, it, they were B-17. Uh, I was not. Uh, with the group very long, about three months, you know, and uh, so you really don't, you know your crew members, you know your squ squadron people, but beyond that, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to know people. Un that's unfortunate, you know, now that uh, we're older guys, we wish we had, uh, had, had, had the occasion but you know we were, we were so busy uh, that we really didn't get to know people like we'd like to. What is your opinion of the uh, importance and the effectiveness of of P seventeen and the group that came from their contribution to the war effort? Well, I can't say enough for the crews. They were very dedicated. And they were like me. We were kids, and we were afraid, but we were well trained, and we responded to our training. Thank God. Uh, but the integrity of the airplane—I can't say enough for that. I mean, that airplane was so superior to any other aircraft in World War II, as far as armament, uh, just the integrity of the airplane stood up. Uh, and crew members, you know, that was their job, and we did it, and we were glad to do it, and we were, every mission that we took off, uh, we were a little afraid, but we knew that was our job, and it was whatever Jimmy Doolittle, who was our commanding general, during 1994, whatever he directed us to do, that was the best, uh, best job for us. So we responded.